How are you doing? This is Mike here, and in this question, we're going to discuss. In this video, we're going to discuss how to calculate a limiting reactant. But specifically, this this video is going to be part of a series of videos. I don't like to make my videos too long, so so in this specific section of the video of the video series, I'm going to discuss how to calculate a limiting reactant. So how are we going to calculate a limiting reactant based off the fact that we're given two individual reactants. We're given that we are reacting 190.4 grams of C2H6 with 94.0 grams of oxygen. So in this question, we have to actually do a lot more thinking than the way it's presented. I sort of look at a question and I think to myself, okay, how much work do I expect to do? Usually that's predicated based on how long the question is, but this is really just one sentence, but there's actually a lot of work involved in this. So don't feel overwhelmed if if you feel that you've tried this and there's a lot more work that you're doing and you're probably going on the wrong path. Probably speaking, if you're doing a lot of work, you're right. So let's go ahead and I always like to identify what I'm given, especially when I'm working in any kind of applied mathematical section. I always like to determine what I'm given. So now recognize here that I'm given 190.4 grams of C2H6. This is also known as ethane. C2H6 is also known as ethane. Nothing that you have to recognize at this point, but if some of you go into organic chemistry, you're going to see it quite often. And then this is also reacted. It's reacted, as it's stated in the question, with 94.0 grams of oxygen. But I always, I always watch out for this oxygen. I always, I always want to make sure that I recognize that, that I have some special elements, and these things are called diatomic. These are diatomic or molecular elements, and they create diatomic and molecular molecules. And that means that they never ever exist by themselves. So I remember the term Brinkelhoff, Brinkelhoff, and these all have to exist in a diatomic way. They, they, they have to be attached to themselves. They never exist just by the sole element. It can never just be, for example, you know, C2H6 reacts with O or reacts with F. It has to be O2 or F2. So that is very important that we recognize these diatomic elements, these diatomic molecules. So now I have to write out a balanced equation. So it's imperative for me to write out a balanced equation. So before I can go ahead and write out a balanced equation, I have to write out a reaction. Um, a balanced reaction, I'm sorry, this should be a balanced reaction, not a balanced equation, a balanced reaction. So before I can, before I can write out a balanced reaction, I have to write out a reaction. So the first thing that I like to do is that I like to start with my, my reactant. So notice here that I'm given C2H6, so I write out C2H6, and this is reacted, so I wrote a positive sign that is indicative, that's indicative of a reaction between two different molecules with 94.0 grams of oxygen. But remember, that oxygen we're not going to write as O. We're going to write this as O subscript 2. So hopefully we recognize, hopefully we recognize at this point, at this point, that this C2H6 is a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon. And this is just fancy word for a molecule that contains both carbon, carbon, and hydrogen. Hydrogen, hydrocarbon. And this is reacted with oxygen. And hopefully we recognize a hydrocarbon and an oxygen will always, always, always yield carbon dioxide and water. It will always yield carbon dioxide and water. So these combustions react these combustion reactions are really important because we see them so often. If we are heating our house using natural gas, or maybe we decide on a summer day to go outside and to grill some food and we we use a propane tank. We use a propane tank, and propane is a type of hydrocarbon as well. Propane is a type of hydro hydrocarbon as well. Whenever we react this, actually, and, and these are really important too, is that we're going to take this, and these actually have some subscripts. This is going to be a liquid. This is going to be a gas. This is going to be carbon dioxide as a gas, and then water as a gas. So I always find that really interesting. And I know that when I've seen people grill over the the, the, the holidays, or maybe it's just a random weekend and you're grilling out, sometimes I look at a grill and it looks like, I remember when I was a young kid, my parents 
he used to tell me that that was the heat coming off. Sometimes I'd see like little waves, look like there were little waves or augmentations in my visibility, being able to look directly at the, at the, at the grill. And my dad used to tell me, oh, that's the heat coming off the grill. And actually, this, he, he was sort of correct in an essence that this is an exothermic reaction because this does produce heat, but you don't have to worry about this at this point. This is just something you're gonna learn later on. But in actuality, what was happening is that was the water vapor. So that water vapor because was, was, actually, was actually being emitted and floating up because of the reaction of the hydrocarbon and the oxygen, the combustion reaction. So that was actually water vapor that I was seeing when it was coming off the grill. It looked, it looked like it was like a, like a mirage almost. It looked very wavy and, and it was floating up and my dad used to tell me that was the heat. Well, that's okay. But now since we actually wrote out the reaction, we have to write out the reaction, we wrote out the reaction, and now we have to balance it. Now we have to balance this reaction. So I always, I always have a very unique way that I use in order to balance reactions. And I usually just, when I say it's unique, I don't know if it's unique, but it's exactly how I do it. And what I do is that I work my way left to right, and I make sure that I have no odd amount of elements. So I give myself a lot of space, and I want to make sure that I have no odd elements. So the first thing that I recognize here is that I start out with my, my carbon. I realize over here that I have two carbons. I have two carbons. Over here, I only have one carbon. So this guy, this carbon dioxide has to get a coefficient of two. So then I start from the beginning again. I have two carbons over here. I have two carbons over here, so I'm good. Next thing I know, I go to my hydrogens, and I have six hydrogens over here. So I have no other hydrogens on my left side. Over here, I only have two hydrogens. So I'm going to multiply this times a value of three, a coefficient of three, because that will give me three times two, which gives me that six hydrogens. But notice what's happening over here is that I have O1, H2O1, only one oxygen. And three times one will give me a value of three oxygens. And one thing that I always like to say is that I never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, never, want odd oxygens. I never want odd oxygens. So here's where I'm going to use some preemptive foresight. Yes, you might say, okay, you have two times two, which gives you four oxygens here, but this gives me a value of three. Four plus three will give me seven oxygens on my right side, but I'm going to save myself a lot of time and heartache, and I don't want to multiply H2O by a value of three. I'm going to double it. So I'm going to say always double always double. So that means this three is going to go away. This three is going to go away. And I'm going to double that three. And I'm going to get a value of six. So if I would have kept that three, I would have had an odd amount of auctions on my right side. It would have been very complicated. I don't want to have complicated amount. I don't want that. So, so I'm going to make sure that I eliminate that odd auction by multiplying by a value of six. So now I can continue. I'm going to start my way from left to right. So I'm going to start my way from left to right. So the first thing I recognize is that I have two carbons here and I still have two carbons here. So that's a check. Now I have six hydrogens over here, but I have six times two, which gives me 12 hydrogens over here. What do I have to do? I have to multiply this C2H6 by a value of two. So I'm going to multiply this by a value of two. And I start again. Whenever I change a coefficient, whenever I add a coefficient, I always start from the beginning working left to right. So let's see. Two times two carbons gives me a value of four carbons. Here I have, uh-oh, look what happens here. I have two times one carbon. That gives me two. So this carbon, carbon dioxide coefficient, is going to have to change. It's going to have to change from a coefficient of two to a coefficient of four because I have to double that, recognizing that I have to make sure to balance my carbons. I work left to right. And then I start from the beginning again. So I have two times two carbons, which gives me four carbons over here. I have four times one carbon, which gives me four carbons over here, so I'm good. Now I get two times six, which gives me a value of 12 hydrogens, so I have 12 hydrogens over here. And notice I still have six times two, and I have 12 hydrogens over here. I'm really happy the way this is going. And now I recognize that I will have to balance this, this auction. I have to add a coefficient of this oxygen last. So now what I do is that I look at my oxygen. So from this carbon dioxide molecule, I have four times two, which gives me eight oxygens. And here I have six times one, which gives me six oxygens. 
So hopefully we can all recognize that I have a total of six plus eight, which gives me a total of 14 oxygens. Here, this is diatomic, and that's the reason why I say make sure your oxygens in this circumstance have an even number on both sides, because now you say, okay, what do you have to multiply O2 by in order to get 14? Hopefully we all recognize this is a value of seven because seven times two gives us a value of 14 oxygens. So that means that this guy is completely balanced. It's gonna be two C2H6s plus seven O2s yields four CO2s plus six H2O. So we have balanced this equation. Woo, that's a lot of work so far. And we still haven't got to the limited reactant portion. So now I go back up and I see what I'm given. And oh, I didn't finish writing this, I apologize. This is set 94.0 grams of O, to 94.0 grams of O2. So now we have to start out determining which one's the limiting reactant. Basically what that's saying is which one of these are we gonna use up first? If we are reacting both out completely, which one of these are we gonna use first? And that's how we're able to determine the, li the limiting reactant. So now you can choose either one. You can choose either one. You can either choose the C2H6 or you can choose the O2. I'm just going to choose the C2H6. So I have 190.4 grams of C2H6. So I'm going to start off by writing out 190.4 grams of C2H6. Now I'm going to have to convert this all the way into grams of O2. I want to compare this to my oxygen. So now when I look at this, I think about, okay, the first thing I do is that I want to go from grams, I have to go grams into moles. I can only use moles to compare my reactants. So I know that I'm going to have times one mole of C2H6 per every, this is the, mole, the molar, molecular weight, the molar mass, 32.0 grams of C2H6. And I multiplied it like this because notice, look what cancels. My grams of C2H6 cancel my grams of C2H6, and now I'm left in moles of C2H6. I can use my stoichiometry now. I can use my stoichiometric coefficients, and I recognize from my balanced reaction that I know that two moles of C2H6 are required in order to combust seven moles of O2. Maybe it's the other way around. Seven moles of O2 are required to combust two moles of C2H6. So I can use this as a ratio as well. So now I recognize that I have seven moles of O2 per every two moles of C2H6. And I'm particular about the way I did this. I didn't invert this value. I didn't invert this and say it was two moles of C2H6 per every seven moles of O2 because look what cancels now. My moles of C2H6 cancel my moles of C2H6. So now I am in moles of O2. And from moles of O2, I can then calculate grams of O2. How do we do that? We look at the molecular weight. We say, okay, the molecular weight was given. We know there's 32 grams per mole of O2. So I can write this as times 32.0 grams of O2 per every one mole of O2. And alas, Notice my moles of O2 cancel my moles of O2, and I am in grams of O2. So now I'm gonna take out my calculator, and I'm gonna use a graphing utility in order to determine this. So let me go ahead and pull this over here so you all can see it. Oops, let me go back and get that. So let me keep this on top. Uh, always in front, there we go. So now, always make sure you can use your calculator. Make sure you can use your calculator. So I have to make mine a little smaller. Uh, okay, just a little bit smaller so we can all see the, the, the keys. I'm having issues, whoops, too big. Okay, my calculator's giving me some issues here. Okay, there we go, so I have 190. Mm. So I'm having a little issue. Okay, come on. There we go, sorry about that, here we go. So I have 190.4 and I'm multiplying this times one, but then I divide it by 32. So I'm just gonna say divided by 32.0, which is divided by 32. I have to multiply this times seven, and then I hit enter. And then I divide this by two, and I hit enter. Multiply times seven, divide by two, hitting enter every time. And then last, I multiply this times 32.0. And notice I get 666.4. I think I did that correctly. Um, 
Oh my goodness, look, I think I, I made a slight mistake. So a little, little off here somewhere. And notice um, my C2H6 actually was a molar mass of 30.0 grams per mole. So I apologize for that little error. This should be 30.0 grams per mole. So let me go back and recalculate. Let me go back and recalculate. I apologize, I, I put that in there incorrectly. So I have 190.4. And I'm going to divide that by 30 times 7, divide by 2, and then I multiply times 32. And this gives me 710.83, or I'm just going to say 711 grams. So this gives me 711 grams. So if you guys caught that mistake earlier, bravo to you. I made a slight mistake, and I'll correct that in my YouTube video, uh, that this should have been 30.0 grams. So therefore, therefore, that changed the calculation. Did I recognize that? No, it was just me doing this problem once or twice before, and that's why I knew this answer was not correct. So I always like to do a little translation. Now, I like to do a little translation. So let me go ahead and do a little translation. So what does this mean? What does this mean? This says that if I use, if I use 190.4 grams of C286, I need 711 grams of O2 to completely react with the C2H6. However, however, think about this. In this question, we were only given 94.0 grams. We only have 90, uh, 94.0 grams, I believe it was 94.0, let me check, 94.0 grams, therefore, we do not have enough O2. We need 711 grams, but we only have 94.0 grams. Since we don't have enough O2, O2 is the limiting reactant. And that's how we calculate the limit reactant for this question. It was definitely a little lengthy, but it's great practice to do this once or twice. It's very important for you to be able to translate and understand what you're doing algebraically and make sure it actually has some application to you so you understand you know what you're doing. So keep that in mind. In the next video, we're going to talk about how to determine how to determine a quantity of product produced by this reaction. And the last video, we're going to determine how much excess of the non-limiting reactant exists. So definitely practice this one a couple times, understand it, be able to do it without looking at any notes. It will definitely show up on an exam sometime in a chemistry course.